Nuri Turkel, it's a pleasure to have you with us here today. Thank you for joining us for IOHR TV. Thank you very much for your interest. Now, you're a Uyghur and you're incredibly proud of the fact that you are. But from day one, you have been discriminated against because of your racial um, background. Tell me the story of how you were born in a prison cell. I was born at, in a prison cell in Kashgar during the uh, Cultural Revolution. Uh, in that period, a lot of Uyghur intellectuals, artists, uh, thought leaders were thrown to jail. Um, in the late 70s, uh, things started getting back to normal. My parents were allowed to return to work and others also being released. Um, because of this horrific life experience that I had, um, I grew up uh, hearing about the brutality that my mother in particular uh, was forced to uh, experience at a very young age. She was barely 20 when this, all this happened. Um, and it's inconceivable and it's hard to believe that history is repeating itself. Um, I can say with certainty that the repression that I have been uh, directly, indirectly experiencing has been uh, happening as long as my lifetime. Why are the Uyghurs in the Xinjiang area? Why are they, are they being persecuted and why are they being herded and put into these concentration camps? The, historically, there has been a mentality in the Chinese leadership that the Uyghurs are, are others. Um, they're kind of cute, foreign-looking people uh, with colorful clothes, good food, uh, beautiful um, uh, geographical significant, in a beautiful homeland with uh, mountains, lakes, and rivers. Uh, but that kind of uh, positive interest uh, become uh, a self-made enemy in the Uyghurs, uh, particularly since 9-11. The Chinese government has been telling the world since 9-11 that they are also combating extremism or terrorism. Uh, and the Western governments, uh, in a way, are responsible for the Chinese to in further that uh, escape goat terrorism claim. Uh, this mentality and this approach uh, helped Xi Jinping to implement new policy uh, around the time that they launched, uh, his government launched the Belt and Road Initiative or China Dream Project. Uh, when you look at the Uyghur's homeland uh, on the map, it sits in a strategically important region uh, in a Eurasia mass landmass. It has over 1,000 uh, kilometers uh, international border. It is a gateway to Euro-Asian, even African market. Uh, it is um, geopolitically very important for China's uh, counter-influence effort against the United States, other Western powers, or even for Russia. Um, that's one reason, geopolitical reason, one reason. And the other, the other is a political reason. Since Xi Jinping took office in 2012, um, it, China has turned itself into a one-man country. Uh, this is why we've been seeing China becoming increasingly uh, authoritarian uh, and tyrannical. And not suppressing not only uh, the others, uh, ethnic minorities, but also their own citizens. The social credit system, uh, digital, digital, digital surveillance, um, uh, and monitoring the activities, daily lives, private lives of their citizens. Uh, has displayed the signs of signs of insecurity in Xi Jinping's leadership. So they wanted to quarantine a potential threat that would undermine Xi Jinping's leadership and Communist Party's survival. And finally, um, this has a lot to do with racism. Uh, this should shock the conscience when any government, uh, any authority, any political leader criminalize an ethnic group based on ethnicity, religious practices. For the Chinese government, Uyghur Islam is a mental illness. Uyghur's cultural appreciation or sense of, uh, uh, for the Chinese government, uh, Uyghur's sense of appreciating their cultural values mm -hmm. is a cancerous tumor. Uh, their way of leading a spiritual life practicing their religion 
as a sign of men mental illness, coupled with the perception by the Chinese governments that these are the hallmarks of disloyalty to the central government. Do we have any idea what happens in these, the Chinese government call them re-education camps, you call them giant prisons, uh, they're called concentration camps. What actually happens there? So you need to look at how, and what, uh, how do they end up being in the camps and what kind of people do they have in the camps. The way that you end up in the camps is as harmful, harmless as talking to someone in a foreign country. I know, I know it for a fact. Mm -hmm. Several of my friends uh, were social contacts, were acquaintances, uh, been telling their stories of their loved ones, family members, end up being in the concentration camps simply because of, their, um, because of them having a foreign contact. Guilt by association. And the other type is social elites, business leaders, even athletes, pop stars, movie stars, anyone who has influence in society uh, or rallying force uh, have been taken away. So when you, uh, when you see uh, this kind of behaviors and th thought process in the Chinese government's leadership uh, and urgently putting in place some measures to, to stamp out the Uyghur national identity, uh, whatever they call it, uh, makes no sense. Um, I have to say this, anyone believes in Chinese government's narrative should have head examination. Them showing the Potemkin village to some friendly, sympathetic governments does not change the narrative, even though that change, changes the structure of the sentence, the wording. The reality, these are uh, real concentration camps. Scholars, journals, and very senior government officials, particularly in the United States, have used the terms like internment camps, concentration camps, mm -hmm. and words like world has not seen anything like it since 1930s. These are the statements made by a very serious, very ser uh, uh, senior government officials in the United States. That includes uh, Assistant De Secretary of State uh, Randy Shriver, um, a senior diplomat Michael Kozak, even Vice President Mike Pence. Uh, I know when, he, when I say that the other country, uh, other leaders who believe in democracy, yeah. who believe in human values, should be feel a little uncomfortable because they should also say or make the similar statements in solidarity with the Uyghurs and in defense of civil liberties. Earlier I spoke to Bill Browder um, and he was talking about what the international community should be doing to help the Uyghurs and he said it's a no-brainer. He said we hit them where it hurts and we just don't do business with them. Why isn't this happening? Uh, for a couple of reasons. Um, the number one reason, I think the Chinese government made a calculus initially that the world is in disarray. We live in a leaderless world. There's no one single leader today in uh, free societies could take the leadership. We have government officials, that's a fundamentally different thing. We need to have a leader or leaders collectively come together, speak in one voice with very specific objectives and, and, and mindset to rectify a situation. We have not seen it. And also, the Chinese government also made a calculus that the business communities will not raise a finger. So, and also thirdly, the Chinese government also taking advantage of this uh, Islamophobia in the West. Let's face it, we have problem with people uh, having negative views about certain religious minorities. Perhaps you should follow this model. It's working. So what do we do? we should go after the businesses. Mm -hmm. I think there's some momentum in the United States Congress that already showing some result. Uh, Google stopped supporting Huawei. And there's a conversation ta actively taking place in the United States that they will ban some technology companies. Uh, the Hague Vision have been circulated a lot in the news. Uh, that makes world's uh, one third of world's security cameras mm -hmm. and believed to be uh, partly owned by the Chinese government. So answer is very simple. Political leaders need to grow a backbone. Mm -hmm. And business community need to re-examine their relationship with this police state. Unfortunately, racial targeting isn't confined to China. 
some other countries are actually adopting the Chinese method. What can you tell me about this? It's a disgraceful method. Um, we live in a free society, UK, United States. We give up some of our civil liberties for security, particularly I used to be an aviation lawyer. Mm -hmm. We give up our, uh, some of our civil liberties for the protection of aviation industry, aviation uh, safety. Fine, we adapt. But none of us end up going to the jail after our iris scans being scanned, after having a wrong uh, contact in our phones, after having a wrong applications in our phones. None of these are happening. And we have things called courts to go to. There's a fundamental difference. What we're take, take, talking about is a collective punishment using technology to make people's life miserable. Just imagine for one second. How would you feel if somebody just grabbed your phone and forced you to uh, uh, go through a data scan? What kind of information will be end up in the other end of the technology? What kind of information that you will be forced to give up? Pictures, intimate messages, mm -hmm. emails, private information, bank accounts. This is the reality for the Uyghur people. And the Chinese government is promoting this. Today, we have about 18 countries, as reported in the New York Times. That includes Germany. Do you think that the Adopt majority of the Chinese people are even aware of the situation with the Uyghurs because of the media crackdown, because of cyber security? Do you think that they're fully up to speed? I don't think that the Chinese government, uh, the, I don't think that the Chinese people, ordinary citizens, are aware of this, mm -hmm. unless you're part of the establishment unless you're part of this internal debate and deliberation and discussions, I think the Chinese citizens uh, need to be no notified and put on, no put, put on notice. The social credit system is a disastrous idea. Mm -hmm. uh, it's state surveillance, pervasive state surveillance establishment in the process of being expanded to other regions is a disastrous idea. Protecting national interest, social uh, security is another thing. You know, we all need to have certain level of law enforcement to protect our safety. But this kind of collective punishment with a very specific, intrusive uh, uh, objective in mind, mm -hmm. it should be condemned and should be uh, stopped. Mary Turkle, we thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much for having me.